Well, good morning, everyone. It has been an incredible uh, weekend thus far. Uh, If you've got your Bibles, I want to encourage you, go ahead and open them up to Mark chapter 28. Uh, That's where we're going to be uh, starting off our service this morning, Mark chapter 28. Uh, A couple of things before we get going. Um, One of the things that we recognize as we've talked about 2021 and some of the things that we we really want to strive towards uh, this year is that we recognize all of us uh, learn in different ways. And each week we gather in this particular space and we hear from God's word. And some of us can be really good learners by just hearing things. Uh, But for me personally, I always have to take notes to really reinforce what I hear. And so starting this weekend, we've actually started uh, handing out these note pages again. And each week as you come in, they're going to be right outside the front doors. You can grab a notes page. You're going to be able to fill in the blank. You're going to be able to follow along in hopes of reinforcing what we're hearing from God's word throughout the week as we go into our small group time during the week. If you're online, we're going to have a way for you to download the notes as well. So don't feel like you're being left out of anything, but make sure that you grab these on your way in. Second thing as we get started this morning, Uh, I don't know about you, but this last week uh, I have giggled a lot, specifically because of this image that is circulating on the internet. This has made me laugh more than anything else has in the last couple of weeks. Having people do this crazy uh, like meme around Bernie Sanders and these terrible mittens that he wore to the inauguration. And I posted something about it the other day, and people have been flooding my comments with like different memes that they found on the internet. And so I thought we'd have a little bit of fun with this. Now, we didn't do this in the first service. Only you guys are going to get this privilege. But what I would love for you to do at some point today is whether if you want to take a picture now during the service or whatever, I would love to see Northside page filled with memes of Bernie Sanders. Best caption wins $20 Chick-fil-A Jesus chicken next weekend. That's right, we're bringing out the Jesus chicken. You know this is serious when we start pulling out Jesus chicken. All right, so best one, you got to tag Northside Christian Church. You tag us, the staff will pick on Wednesday. We'll announce next weekend who's going to get the Jesus chicken gift certificate. So make sure you participate in this as well. But we as a church, the last five weeks, moving on quickly. um, Over the last five weeks, we have been in this series titled DNA. We are exploring who God has uniquely crafted us as a church to be in our community, to be in our world. That we are looking at what is our mission? What is the things that drive us as a church to really accomplish what God has called us into? And we started off by looking at our mission statement of what does it mean to love God, love others? What does this look like for us to to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all our soul, mind, and strength? How is that lived out? And we we looked at that and then talked about loving others and how we love other Christians and how we make converts. And and really what we're talking about is discipleship. This idea of what does it mean to be a fully devoted follower or disciple of Jesus? And and what is the starting point of discipleship? That as we become Christian, and, and where are we to go in this process? And this call of discipleship is for every one of us that's a Christian. There are no disciples that don't go and and do this mandate of making disciples because Jesus gives this mandate in Matthew chapter 28. If you're looking at it with me, verse 18 is where we're going to start. It says this, then Jesus came to them, meaning his disciples. He's taken them over to Galilee. He's about ready to go into heaven and he's going to give them some last instructions. So he comes to them and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now this is key. Jesus has overcome the grave. And because he was obedient to the Father, submitting himself to to crucifixion, God has elevated him, has given him authority on heaven and on earth. And with that authority, Jesus then gives this command to his disciples. He says, therefore, because I have this authority, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus' marching orders, Jesus' commission to to those that follow him is to go and make disciples. 
every one of us, go and make disciples, converts, new Christians, new followers of Jesus. And we understand as a church, this is our mantra for 2021. The greatest way we can love others is by introducing them to a loving Jesus. You see, friends, we can buy someone's groceries, but if they spend eternity separated from Jesus, because we never shared Jesus with them, we've not truly loved them. We can feed the homeless, we can take care of the poor, but if we fail to share Jesus with them, we have not fully loved them. We are called, rather, we are commanded by Jesus to go into our world, to make disciples by introducing people through our words and our actions to a loving Jesus. And so over the last three weeks, we've been exploring our core values as a church, these things that are, are true of who we are. And they're found on the wall over here. They're on our website. And we've explored three of them that we really feel God is moving us forward in for 2021. We talked about My Invitation Matters. And we set some goals around that, that we want to see 200 new families come through the doors of our church with 25 new baptisms, new converts to Christianity. We talked about how uh, building better families, how we want to partner with families, the church and home coming together to develop fully devoted followers of Jesus. We looked at Faith Grows Best in Groups and and what that means for us as well. And and all of these core values are, are there for us to introduce people to a loving Jesus. And so we've given a whole lot of information over the last couple of weeks. And maybe you've heard these things and are thinking, yeah, that's great. We'd love for for more people. We'd love for more connection groups. We we would love for for more things with our kids. How are we going to do it? What's the how behind these things? And and so today I want to share with you the how. We're calling it a discipleship pathway. How we take a person who has no relationship with Jesus to becoming a full-time disciple of Jesus. And it applies for every one of us who call Northside home. And I want to start out by telling you why we are doing this. Uh, In a book that I read, it's called uh, Church Unique. It's by an author named Will Mancini. And in this book, Mancini says and claims that 98% of churches in America are functioning without a clear idea of where they hope to lead people on their spiritual journey. Now, I don't know about the statistic and that percentage, but I think he's probably right. That many churches... have no clear way of showing where they hope to go in helping people on their spiritual journey in growing into what it is to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And so instead, what happens is churches resort to programming. We add more programs in hopes that people will find the program that will help them grow. And so there's always this hope. There's always something else. So we add a men's program, a women's program. We add a, a program for those that are married with, without children or those that are single with children. We add programming for those that love Star Wars and for those that love Star Trek. And, and so we just hope that people will get involved in some way and will grow in their faith in Jesus. Involvement becomes the motivation. It becomes the indicator of whether or not someone is growing in their faith. But it's not a very good indicator, is it? Because you can be going to a a men's group, you can be going to a Star Trek group and not growing in your faith in Jesus. So how do we make sure that people are growing, that it's not just about involvement, but about movement? We want people to move forward in their spiritual formation. I love how Andy Stanley said it. He he talks about this in his book, Seven Practices of Effective Ministry. And Andy Stanley says, think steps, not programs. You see, really what Stanley is, is trying to say is that programming is meant to support steps, not programming driving discipleship. Instead of having a strategic vision around the the programming side of things, you think in terms of steps. What's the next step a person should do to grow in their discipleship, to grow in their following of Jesus? And what's the end goal? 
What does it look like? And you give them steps along the way to do this. And, and this is moving from point A to point B to point C in discipleship. And Jesus' great commission is to go and make disciples. So what are the steps along the way? What do we need to do? Because Jesus, when we look at his model, all of a sudden he goes and he finds these men and he says, come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Come, follow me. There's an actionable step that they are to do to showcase they are a disciple of Jesus. It was number one, come, follow me. And it began there. And so what what does it look like for us as a church with these core values, with this mission statement in mind? What are the steps? What is the discipleship pathway that we want to take people on to grow in their relationship with Jesus? And so we've come up with something as a staff. And, and if you've got that notes page, we're going to fill in the blanks on this. But this is what our discipleship pathway looks like. And I'm going to spend a brief amount of time on each one of these this morning, outlining the biblical premise of why we've landed on these things so that we can understand where we're going in 2021. And we as a staff have spent a lot of time praying and talking through how to articulate this so that people will know this is the way of discipleship here at Northside. And it begins, point of entry, it begins with this first one, encounter God. It's all about encountering God. You see, I believe that there are times where we as Christians try to get flashy with a saying. We, we try to get catchy in, in doing something or showcasing in order that hoping someone will receive the message of salvation that comes from Jesus. And while I believe there's space to be creative, I believe in having sayings that resonate with people that they can share on social media or that, that stick with them for long periods of time, the greatest way people come to faith is by encountering the living God. It's by coming face to face with God. And as they do, their lives are changed. If you've got your Bibles, I want to show you, showcase an example of this. It's in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. There's this amazing account of this in action. We see the early church has begun and that the message of Jesus is, is starting to spread. That there's this, this rumblings in, in the Jewish culture of, of this man named Jesus, this carpenter's son, who died at the hands of the Romans. But there's this group of people that are saying he rose from the dead three days later and that he's the true Messiah. And this begins to, to disrupt the Jewish community of what it is of waiting for the promised Messiah. And so the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they begin to persecute these followers of this man, Jesus. And this man named Stephen goes before the council and they, they throw big rocks at his head until he dies. And there's a man that's holding the cloaks of all of those that were throwing rocks. His name is Saul. And Saul is a Pharisee. He's a man of God by all outward appearance. He abides by the law. He does all of the right things. He goes to church every week. He goes to small group on Wednesday nights. I mean, he does everything right. He's obeying the law of God and to the point that he's going to now protect the law of God at all costs. And Paul or Saul goes out and he begins to persecute Christians. He starts arresting them and rounding them up to stand trial for this heresy of this man named Jesus. And yet Saul encounters God in a very profound way. Look at verse three with me. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So here's this man. He stands against everything that, that these Jesus followers stand for. He's on the road to go round up some Christians, and he has this encounter with, with God, with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Jesus speaks to him. And I don't have enough time to get into everything that happens in the rest of this chapter, but basically Saul gets knocked off of his horse. He gets up, and he's blind. He can't see. 
And so the, the people that are with him are taking him into Damascus. He sits in Damascus for three days blind. He can't see anything, waiting for what Jesus will tell him to do. At the same time, there's this man by the name of Ananias. Ananias is a godly man, and God speaks to Ananias and says, hey, by the way, uh, there's this man named Saul. I want you to go talk to him. Ananias is like, Saul? You mean the guy that's been persecuting Christians? I ain't going to have none of that. No way. I'm not going. And I love verse 15. Verse 15, God says, go. And I was like, okay, enough said. I'm going. Ananias goes and he prays with Saul and, and it's like scales are falling off of Saul's eyes. He can see again. And he speaks with Ananias. And Saul goes down to the water and is baptized. And most of us from our, our Christian roots know him as Paul, who would go out and become the greatest missionary of Christianity ever to have been seen, planting churches all across the Roman Empire, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, even when it would cost him everything. Why? All because he encountered God. All because he had an encounter with the Almighty. And friends, that's what we try to do on the weekend here at Northside. We try to create space for people to encounter God in really profound ways. I know that there are jokes that that people love to make about pastors that, hey, pastor, you only work on Sundays, right? Gotcha, right? Or like, oh, hey, Jared, he just gets up and he picks some songs based off the radio and we just sing those songs and and it's no big deal. Or, you know, Pastor, you just probably wrote your sermon like last night right before bedtime. And I understand that there are jokes about that that happen. Um, But we spend a lot of time as a team thinking of how can we help you encounter the living God in a profound way. Every Tuesday, our team gets together. We have a meeting called our worship planning meeting where we spend time and we think through every element of the service of how will this help people encounter God this week? Whether it's the announcements, whether it's the communion thought of how we're going to shape it, whether it's the sermon and how it plays a part in in the aspects of connecting with people, you name it, we cover it top to bottom. Why? Because we understand that this is a time where people can encounter God in profound ways. And don't get me wrong, I understand you can encounter God anywhere, right? Right? Like some people I know, they're crazy. They love to encounter God out in the woods with the snakes and the spiders. You're crazy. I know some people that love to encounter God as they're running marathons. Like they, they love to encounter God as they, they work out. Or you can encounter God in the desert where it's blazing hot or out in the Arctic where it's really cool. I personally like to encounter God in heat-controlled rooms. Am I right? <laughs> nice comfy chair. Like a loudspeaker, I don't have to hear it. You know, like I just I like to encounter God this way. We can encounter God any one of these ways. But discipleship begins in encountering God because, friends, you need to hear me in this. There is nothing I will say that will, will save your friend. I will not save your colleague, your spouse. There's only one who can. His name is Jesus. I hope to introduce you to him. We encounter God. And what happens for Christians is many times as we look at the encounter God aspect, Christians get comfortable chasing experiences of encountering God. And they jump from experience to experience thinking that this is the end point, that if I would just encounter God once again, if I would just hear something profound from his word once again, that will make everything okay. But this is the entry point in discipleship. It is not the end point. We begin with an encounter of God that shapes us, that that changes our trajectory in life. And as we get into this, then we move out of the encounter of, of, of God and we move into this next phase, which we're calling connect and grow. It's the connect and grow phase of things. When we say connect and grow, we mean we are connecting with God and we are growing in relationship with him. And at the same time, we are connecting with the people around us, the people of God, and growing in relationship with them as well. I liken this to dating, okay? Think back when you met your spouse. You had an encounter with them, right? I remember when I first encountered Karen. It was at a hockey game. 
And I remember thinking, as, as I look back at it, thinking, how you doing? That was a great encounter, wasn't it? She's so uncomfortable right now. I love it. Why? Because I've now grown to know more about Karen. That encounter started something, but it was only as I spent time with her. It was only as I asked questions and I got to know her, I got to see her heartbeat, that I fell deeply, deeply in love with her. It was because I connected and grew in my relationship with her. And in the same way, friends, it's the same with God. There are so many times where God wants to go depth with us, and yet we just are chasing the encounter that we miss the connection, the depth of relationship that God has yearned for his people. And it's the same thing in our discipleship, that as we grow in our knowledge of who God is, as we grow in our our knowledge and understanding and our, our depth of his great love for us, that we grow even more in love with him. And it continues on. It means growing with him. And as a church, we believe that this happens best in small group community. We believe that faith grows best in groups. We believe that faith grows best when we gather together in small groups that study God's word, build relationships, and serve. We believe that every person should be in a small group. We call them connection groups here at Northside. If this is your church home, you should be in a small group. You should be plugged in, not just for the connection of God through Bible study, that matters, that's important, but through the connection and understanding of other Christians and people in similar stages of life and similar understanding of God that you can grow in relationship with. Because when we take one of those components out, it's no longer what God intended a small group to be. Take away the Bible study, you have a social club. Take away the fellowship and that building relationships. Now you have an academic lecture. It's all of these things. We need to grow in these things. And friends, we need to be reminded of this. Christianity is not a solo sport. Christianity isn't meant for lone rangers. Christianity was meant for community. It is meant for Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, to come together. Why? Because when the going gets tough and things get hard, you have other people standing with you, ready to do battle with you, ready to pray with you, ready to encourage you. Solo Christians get picked off by the enemy. We are called to be in community, connecting with one another, growing with one another in this. And then we put our faith in action by serving, which leads us to the next next aspect of this wheel uh, in our discipleship pathway, which is to live generously. Living generously. Now, even as I state that, people get anxious. Because immediately we think of generous as financial, right? Oh, here we go again. The pastor wants our money. And I I understand that an aspect of generosity is money. Don't get me wrong. Scripture's clear. Where your money is, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. I can see where people spend their money. I know what's important to them. Take my son. My son's 11 years old. He's going to be 12 years old. And twice a month, we give him an allowance. And and we give him the money. And I know immediately within 24 hours, he's going to say, Dad, can we go buy an Xbox gift card? Why, son? Because there's this really cool skin that I want for my Rocket League car. Yes, son, let's go do that. He spends every dollar he has on video game stuff. Every dollar. Why? Because it matters to him. And in the same way, we could look at anything that we do and where we spend our money tells me what matters to you, what matters to me. It could be in cars, It could be in food. It could be in desserts. It could be in clothes. It could be in sports. It it could be in houses or vacations or bikes or or coffee. I mean, you name it. You, You look at where you spend your money and you can see where your heart is, what matters to you. But even more than that, there's a new kind of currency that tells me where your heart is. Can anyone tell me what it is? Time. 
where you spend your time tells me what matters to you most. A a scholar that I, I follow said, today your time is the currency of your life. And so if I was to look at where you're spending your time, I'll understand what matters to you. Because we only have so much time. We're so busy. We have so many functions with our kids and and activities with our families that, that we have a limited amount of time. And so where we spend our time, where we give our finances, where we live generously tells me a lot. It tells us a lot. And part of the reason why this is so important is because Ephesians 2.10 tells us exactly why we were created. I want you to look at this passage with me. For we are God's handiwork, created, key word. We are created in Christ. So as we are in Christ, we are created for what? To do good works. Every one of us was created in Christ to do good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. God has given you skill sets. God has given you unique talents and abilities that he has created you to do good works with. So as as Christians, we are called to put our faith in action. We are called to serve. We are called to live generously, giving outside of our normal behaviors for the cause of Christ. And friends, this isn't just about serving in our church. Don't get me wrong. We love people that serve in our church. I love the fact that this afternoon we've got a kid's uh, training that's going to be happening for all of these volunteers that give of their time to love our kids. Because without these volunteers, we don't have that ministry. Without volunteers standing at guest uh, services and and greeting people as they come in, we don't have that warm, welcoming environment. And they, they stand there and they shake hands and they welcome people in. That doesn't happen without servants. We don't have incredible worship like we did this morning without our tech team who behind the scenes are making this all possible. Without drummers and guitar players and piano players and singers, we don't have those things without people who give up their time. But it's so much more than that. Living generously is living generously outside the walls of our church. A a question that our elders and our staff have wrestled with Uh, pretty frequently uh, for a season now, is this. If Northside ceased to exist tomorrow, would our community even notice? I gotta tell you, that's a sobering question, isn't it? If the doors of our church closed tomorrow, would the people that live in the neighborhood right across from our church even know that we were gone? And I look at that and I go, this is an opportunity for us to live generously. That as disciples of Jesus, a a Jesus who gave his life, who did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many, this is the next step in our discipleship is to live generous lives. We must find opportunity. I didn't know this, but apparently right here on 71st, I just found this out this last week. I've been here four years. Apparently, we adopted 71st between uh, our church out here and down to, uh, like, Elm to clean up. I had no idea that this was even something that we had. It's an opportunity to serve in our community for us to live this out. And once we live generously and begin this process, we move into the last phase, which is to invite others. We, we've talked a lot about my invitation matters. And the life of a Christian is always about invitation. Here's a statement that if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write down. Saved people invite people. If we have been saved by the grace of God, we are to invite others into that same saving grace. When we talk about my invitation matters, it's inviting someone into the experiences we have encountered with God. We are inviting people to the freedom, to the depth of relationship that we have encountered with God so that they will have that same experience with God. We look at the people around us who don't know Jesus And we say, I need to introduce you to a loving Jesus. Because what he did in me, he can do in you. If he can save a heathen like me, he can definitely save a heathen like you. 
We tell our story of how God has saved us where we were once angry, where we were once addicted, where we were once broken, afflicted, ashamed because of the saving work of Jesus Christ. We're changed and transformed. Every one of us, young and old, has an opportunity to invite. Let me introduce you to a loving Jesus. And as you encounter this loving Jesus, oh, your life will be changed. Your trajectory will be moved in such a way that you won't even recognize who you once were. Let me introduce you to that Jesus. The discipleship pathway is not a destination, friends. As we pull back the, the circle and we look at it, I want you to notice something. That this is as you started yourself. Let's say you came in for the first time, you encountered God, you connect and grow, you live generously, and you invite others. What are you inviting them to? You're inviting them to encounter God. And as a disciple of Jesus, we take that new person, we help them encounter God, and we help them to connect and grow. We help them live generously. We help them to invite others. And the wheel keeps turning. This is how the church has thrived for 2,000 years. Christians recognizing that as they encounter God, they connect and grow with God and grow with others. They live generous lives and they invite others. It just keeps going and going and going and the cause of Christ explodes across the known world. This is what it looks like to make fully devoted followers of Jesus. So when we talk about my invitation matters and how we want 200 new families to come through the doors of our church with 25 new baptisms, it's about encountering God. When Nate talks about how we want our connection groups, that we want 10 uh, new leaders and four new groups with 40 new people, it's all about connecting and growing in our relationship with God. And we recognize we have some gaps when we talk about living generously, we don't know the needs of our community as well as we should. And so we've got some steps in place that we're hoping to be able to find the needs so that we can go to our connection groups and say, guys, we study God's word together, we build relationships, and we serve. Here's a serving opportunity. Let's go meet the need of our community. An invitation. We recognize that many Christians don't know how to share their faith. They don't know what it is to, to step outside their comfort zone and say, let me tell you about the loving Jesus that I know. And so in March, Nate and I are going to be having a class that we hope every person at Northside will attend about evangelism and how we are called to invite. And what does it look like to actually invite someone in hopes that they'll come at Easter to hear about the resurrection of Jesus, which changes everything. And yes, we as a staff we see this discipleship pathway and we go, this is what it looks like for us at Northside and we're gonna help our church step out and do these things themselves but inviting others to do it with them. But friends, we need you as well. If Northside is your church home, have you encountered God? Maybe you're here today and, and you don't have a faith in Jesus. It begins by encountering God. I'm gonna be up here at the front at the end of this service. Let me introduce you to a loving Jesus. I promise you it's worth it. And as you do that, let me get you into a small group where you're gonna connect with God and connect with others. You're gonna grow in your faith with God and your relationship with him and grow in relationship with others. Let us help you. Let us help you live generously of serving our community giving your time and your resources to move the cause of Christ forward so that we can invite others into the same experience and keep the wheel going as it has for the last 2,000 years. I hope you'll join us because I believe as we take on this pathway, as we take these steps, not just programming, programming matters, but they support the steps. We will grow into more fully devoted followers of Jesus and we will see the spiritual landscape of our community and our world change. Why? Because we've seen it happen for the last 2,000 years as people take these steps. Lives are changed. Communities transformed. I hope you'll join us.
And if you're here, again, if you don't know Jesus, after we go through the announcements, I'm going to be up here at the front. I would love to introduce you to the person of Jesus, to help you become a follower of Jesus, to be baptized. And we can celebrate with you what God is doing and start on this process. Let me pray. God, we love you. And Father, I'm so incredibly grateful that you give us a a model of how to become fully devoted followers of, of your son, Jesus. God, I pray that as we leave this place today, Father, we would uh, reflect on where are we at in our discipleship. Father, that as we come into this place each week, as we encounter you, God, you don't want us to just stay there. You want us to have movement moving forward in relationship with you. So may we connect with you. May we grow in relationship with you. As we dive into small groups, may we build relationships, may we study your word, God, and then we move into living generous lives by serving one another and serving our world, serving our community. And as we become the hands and feet of Jesus, we get to introduce people to a loving Jesus through word and action. And we invite them. You are glorified as new souls come to your kingdom, God. God, I pray that if there's anyone here today who does not know you, Father, that your Holy Spirit would stir up inside of them the need for salvation and they would take that step today and we would celebrate as heaven celebrates and we would rejoice with them. We love you, Lord. We pray blessing on this day as we get ready to leave this place going about our week. We Thank you, God, for what you're doing in us and through us. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray these things. Amen.